Strong's View Christian Church. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Um, there was a MS he has sent me to Lord, heal the broken hearted and to preach deliverance. <laughs> To the cat, let no man deceive you. And recovering of sight to by the any blind, means, for the day shall not come, the except there come a falling away first. Strong spiel, Christian church. Amen. So I'd like to welcome everyone to Old Brooklyn Christian Church, soon to be. Christian church. Amen. The message that the good Lord gave me is judge nothing before the time. Amen. Judge nothing before the time. You look at this guy. How many want to stand in front of a judge that looks like this? Amen. Just in case you can't appreciate. Amen. If you see a judge looking at you like that, amen, you know you're in trouble. Amen. <laughs> but uh, this is the message that the Lord gave me. Judge nothing before the time. And um, I don't want to get into the, um, the stereotypical idea of what uh, judging is. Uh, one thing I notice is that Satan exploits and twists the scriptures, and he tries to take advantage of uh, one scripture and does a whole bunch of false doctrines on it. And so what the devil does and what I see take place uh, within Christians is the devil is happy if Christians can go on two extremes of judgments. And I did a whole sermon about this, and uh, the whole entire church was uh, like 50-50 uh, divided. Uh, half the church thought that uh, that you should judge no matter what, unconditionally judge, and the other half thought that you should never judge no matter what. And I think that's where the devil wants the, the church to be, is on one extreme where uh, Christians feel that they have a license to unconditionally judge, to condemn, to send people to hell, and just judge everything and everyone, and just freely judge tell God to sit down, they're going to judge in, in behalf of God and steal God's place, steal God's role, and they're just going to judge uh, freely, un, un, uncontrolled, unbordered, just free judgment. And how many know the Bible doesn't give us that permission? And then you have a lot of Christians that they hold that, that stance, which the devil loves that. Amen? Then you got the other extremist Christians where they feel any form of judgment is evil. All judgment is wrong, and we can't judge anything. They quote scriptures, and, and then the other people quote scriptures, uh, judge righteous judgment. The other people say, oh, uh, judge not for you should be judged. And, and, and how many of you know the truth is there's a balance in God. There's a balance in the word of God, and this is where wisdom is, that there is times that we have to judge. In fact, uh, if you are living, it is impossible to not judge. You have to judge to come to church. You have to judge to put your shoes on. You have to judge what to cook for breakfast. You've got to judge whether to comb your hair or shave your head or grow a beard or shave it off. Yeah, these are all judgments, amen? And for you to stop judging, you literally have to die. But even when you're dead, you're probably still judging. You know, whether you end up in heaven or hell, you're probably judging in hell. You're probably you're in, in hell ju judging one another. You know, I'm, I'm, burning it, I'm burning heavier than you are. No, I'm burning heavier than you are. Then you're up in heaven, you're judging. Wow, look at the beautiful angels. It's, it's, judgment has been a demonized word is what I'm saying. We do not know if people are for us or against us until enough time passes. Amen? We do not know if people are for us or against us until enough time passes. You're going to find out in life, it's going to seem like as long as you meet certain conditions, people are going to be for you. And the moment that your conditions change, you're going to see the people that you thought were for you are no longer for you. They were just for your condition. They were for your situation. They were for you doing a certain thing. And the moment you stop doing that certain thing, now you realize they weren't for you. They were for what you were doing at that time. But see, the problem with that is, is they're judging things before the time. And that doesn't mean that that is your final destination. That doesn't doesn't mean that is your final uh, end of what God is going to bring you to. 
Amen. Sometimes God has you uh, going to go through different places, different situations, circumstances are going to change. And with that, so are the people that are going to be with you. Amen. And I'm going to tell you that there are some people that you might feel that are against you. They could be for you. And there are some people that you know that they are against you, and that doesn't mean that God can't turn them around before you. The Bible says when a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies will be at peace with him. I've experienced in my own life people that were trying to kill me and attack me. I've watched them turn around, and God gave me favor with them, and God used those same people that were against me to support me. I've seen it happen in prison. I was surrounded by three large, enormous, gigantic, large Muslim men that were surrounding me. All There was no six-foot rule. There was no distance. They were in my pr I wish there was a six-foot rule, but there wasn't. And we were in prison, and no one was abiding by the six-foot social distancing rule. And they were all up in my space looking down on me, threatening me intimidating me and through a process of time God took those same three Muslims and these three Muslims they were violent they were and I'm not saying all Muslims are violent I'm talking about these three particular gigantic men they were violent they were knocking people out in prison Ex especially non-Muslims <laughs> especially non-Muslims they were knocking people out Right? And my mom spent too much money on my teeth. And the Bible says, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord. And God told me and gave me the wisdom of what not to say with them and what to say with them. There was times where I could have avoided conversation with them, but God caused me to pursue, to open up, to instigate, to to provoke, to start conversation, to chase after them and, and, and say things to them rather than 100% avoiding them. And, and by being led by God and not even judging them before the time, God turned them around and they became my bodyguards in prison. And one of them told me, he said, if anyone touches you, I will kill them. The same person... Now, I didn't endorse the uh, presumption of murder, but the same person who was uh, now was threatening me became a protector. Do you see how you can't judge nothing before the time? You have to allow God time to do what he does. We do not know if people are for us or against us until enough time passes. And I'm going to tell you, if you're a pastor and you're pastor in a church, now, I've been pastoring a church for going on 10 plus years now. And it don't feel like that, but it went by like this. One thing I learned is there are people, they're going to come to your church. They are going to swear up and down, Pastor, I'm with you to the end of the world until Jesus comes back. You're the greatest. That's okay. But I'm going to tell you this, judge nothing before the time. You don't know if people are for It sounds great, but sometimes you got to sit back and watch. And there's going to be other people, they come into your church and they seem like they're nagging you and annoying you and harassing you, and they could be, end up being the most faithful people. You see that? So if you're pastor a church, judge nothing before time. You don't know who's for you or against you. That's why Apostle Paul said, let a man first be found faithful. You see, you have to sit back and watch, and really you almost need to watch someone for like 10 years. Because a lot of folks that they seem like they're doing something and God's using them, you have to really watch someone over time. And then God will show you. Amen. Not everything is what it seems. Amen. And this is not even just in the church. This is even in your family. This is, this is in your family. There's going to be some family members. It could be your mom. It could be your dad. It could be your grandpa, your grandma, your aunt, your uncle, your cousins. It could be even your own children. This is why Jesus took it to the extent, he said, who is my mother and my brother? Them that do the will of my Father in heaven. The same is. You see that? We don't know if people are for us or against us until enough time passes. Now here's the thing. 
if enough time passes, sometimes through time, things become so obvious that you don't even need to make a judgment. Because it's so obvious that you just, you, you, it's just, it's decided for you. Some decisions that you want to make will be decided before you, for you. That's why the Bible also says, be still and know that I am God. In 1 Kings 3.16, it says, Then came there two women that were harlots. Harlots means prostitutes. And it says that these prostitutes or these harlots, they, they came unto the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, Oh, my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house. Okay, so here you have these two harlots that they work together, right? Now, now here's the thing. They didn't just work together because how many of you know you don't just live with everyone you work with? You ever work at Burger King? Did you live with everyone that you worked with at Burger King? Right? Well, not, you don't always live with the people that you work with. So if you live with someone that you work with, that means that they have some closeness. You see that? So, and then here's the thing. They were living together by choice. You see, there was something about one another that they were drawn to each other that they decided to live together. You see, they liked one another. They thought one another was great. So great that they decided it was a good idea to live together. Not working together was not enough. I'm not getting enough of this person that I need so much more that they need to come and live in my house. I'm greedy for them. I love them so much. They're so great that working is just not enough. I need more of this awesome, wonderful, joyful, soul-satisfying co-worker that I need to bring them in my home and abide with me. I don't want to just work with you. I don't want to just prostitute with you. I want to eat meals with you. I want to sleep with together in the same house. <laughs> but I want to talk to you today about judge nothing before the time. So let's see where the scripture goes. And there came two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before them. And the one woman said, oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> you ever have an oh, my Lord day? Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. And, and, I went, and this woman dwell in one house. I and this woman, woman dwell in one house. I wonder how big was that house that they dwelled in. And I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass on the third day after that, I was, de I was delivered. And this woman was delivered also. And there were two, there were together, and we were together, and there was no stranger with us. Look at that, there was no witnesses. You see, now you went from loving this person to not having enough of this person that you judged them to be the greatest thing since a slice of bread that you needed to bring them into your home and you couldn't get enough. Now you went from that to now I need a witness. Now, now, now I need a witness. Ain't that something? See how quick people can change on you folks? <laughs> look at this. And there was no witnesses. And look, it says, And this woman delivered also. We were together, and there was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me. And while thy handmaid slept, and laid it in her bosom, and laid in her dead child in my bosom. She's saying that she did a swap, <laughs> right? And then the other woman's accusing her of the same thing. So now all of a sudden, this woman that you could not get enough of now has stolen your baby. 
You see that? That's why, that, that's why the Bible says judge nothing before the time. Amen? You got some baby stealings out there. And, and here's the thing. There might not be someone in your life that literally comes and steals your physical baby, but they might try to steal your dream. They might try to steal your hope. They might try to steal your peace. They might try to steal your joy. You see that? Jumping to conclusions without hearing people out causes confusions. Conclusions, confusions. Too quick to conclude, quick to confuse. You see that? You're going to interact with a lot of people from, from just all aspects of life. And you have to make sure that you do not jump to conclusions when dealing with people. That you, you first have to set aside your emotions. You have to set aside your preconceived ideas. You have to set all that aside. And you have to wait to hear people out. And not just one party. You ever heard there's two sides to every story? <laughs> Then the Bible say, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. Amen? It says, jumping to conclusions without hearing people out causes confusions. Confusion. 1 Kings 3.21, it says, And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, which is to breastfeed, Behold, it was dead. But when I had considered in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living son and the dead son is thy son. And this, this said, No, but the dead son is thy son. And the, look, that king was about to get a headache. Look, when you're in a position of authority, people are going to try your patience. They're going to test you. The, all these things are going to happen. But you have to make sure that you ask God to grant you patience and how to work with folks so that the decisions that you make and the judgments that you make are not before the time. Amen. And look at what it says. It says, it says then, the, then said the king, the one said, this is my son that liveth, and the son is dead. And the other said, nay, Thy son is dead and the other ones live. So they were going on and on and on and on. Pretty much that was like the first episode of Jerry Springer <laughs> or Murray Povich, right? Manipulation demons, they hide until they know they can't get what they want. You see, this is one thing I found out is that there are there are demons that, that live inside of people and they are manipulative and they want to get something from you and the moment they don't get what they intended and you tell them no, then what happens, you start to see a different, uh, uh, that demon starts to manifest through that person. And I'm going to tell you, I see this all the time. In fact, me and Dick and Frederick were just at a gas station uh, out in Strongsville and this gentleman, uh, he... Uh, uh, came up upon me and he was asking about uh, that he needed three dollars to buy a house is that correct yeah he, he needed three dollars to buy a house was his story and to secure his story he presented to me a title of a car and to pull on my emotions he explained to me that his wife was handicapped in a wheelchair and that his house was in California, and that he was walking about 10 miles down the road on Pearl Road, and he was trying to get to the owner of, uh, what's that chicken place called? Cane's Chicken. He was trying to get to the owner of Cane's Chicken so that he was way down on uh, Pearl Road, about 10 miles down, where he really needed to get this way. 
And I, I didn't jump to conclusions. I listened to him. I let him talk. I listened to him. And then after he got done, and I said, sir, I said, what is it that you're looking for? And he says, I, I'm looking for $3. And I, I, I do recognize that 99% of society is either going to give them the $3 and not ask any questions, or they're going to tell them no and not any, ask any questions and move on. Well, I'm not on either one of those. I'm not going to give you the $3, and I'm not going to tell you no either. I'm going to ask some questions. You invaded my spot privacy, and you came to me with this presentation, and, and, and so I'm going to ask some questions. And by the time I asked these questions, I said, sir, I, I don't believe that you're telling the truth. And he, like, almost fell back a little bit. He was stunned that I said that. And the moment that I told him no, he started getting loud with me. See, that, that intimidation, that, uh, that threatening, intimidation, fearful spirit started coming out. And I recognized the spirit in him immediately, and I addressed the spirit. I said, sir, and I, and I even lowered my voice a little bit down even lower. And I said, sir, why are you raising your voice? He's like, that's just how I talk. I said, you didn't talk like that when you was asking for the $3. You were nice and sweet. You were nice and sweet and real kind and real polite. It wasn't until I told you no that your voice went up a couple octaves. You see that? And then when I called that out, then he started talking about gambling. So we went from, we went from he needed $3 to buy a house. To now he wants to gamble with me for my Gatorade. <laughs> now I had to make sure I didn't judge nothing before the time. But I concluded after everything was said that this man was a hoax. Amen. <laughs> so eventually he just ended up leaving. He like stormed away. If his story was so legitimate, move on to the next person. He, he was dethroned. He was done. He, he just disappeared. I couldn't find him. I tried to drive off where he was and try to see. He was gone. He just, like, just disappeared. Like, there was a secret tunnel of a thing, like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He just went straight down. Folks, my, my, my point is this, is that we need to hear people out. We need to listen to them. But we have to make sure that we're not being manipulated by demons. Amen? And you're going to see that when people don't get what they want, that's where the manipulation demons come out. And we have to make sure that when we're judging, we're not judging the person, we're actually judging that spirit. Because if you judge the person, you misjudge the spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because that same person that was lying to me is the same person that could become a pastor in a week from now. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm, that's a far extreme case. But that's what happened with me. I was out doing way worse than that. My point is this, is that people are subject to change. You understand? So you don't want to condemn people to hell before the time. And really, there's no time to do that. That's God's duty. But you want to pray for the person and ask for them to get saved. And I was going to go there with that person, but they ran before I had a chance. Manipulation demons hide until they know they can't get what they want. And I'm going to tell you what, you can only take authority over a spirit if you see the spirit. And so if you don't see the spirit within a person, you have no authority over that which you don't see. And when I say see it, I don't mean see it in the natural. I mean identify the spirit in the spiritual. And once you identify the spirit, now you have authority in God to take control over that spirit within that person. And when you see these things, it's like symphony. It's like an orchestra, and, and God is showing you the unseen essential. He's showing you the unseen realm of what's taking place in these people. And these people that are being used by this manipulation spirit, they need to be saved. They need to be saved. In 1 Kings 3, 24, it says, And the king said, Bring me a sword. 
I'm going to tell you what, there was a manipulation spirit operating in one of those prostitutes. You see that? And watch how the one prostitute so quickly changes her attitude when she realizes she can't get what she wants. She goes from wanting the baby to if I can't have it, no one can have it, kill the baby dead. You see that? But that spirit wasn't going to come out until God gave Solomon wisdom and how to judge the situation. And if he would have jumped to conclusions and just judged based off of his pride or based off of his ego or based off of his emotions, he would have misjudged the situation. Do you understand? And look what it says in 1 Kings 3.24. It says, and then the king said, bring me a sword. I like how God operates. They were operating at level 2. Solomon took it to level 1,000. Just like this. No smooth transition. No, uh, let's sit down and, and have a, a, a counseling session. A le just, he went from 0 to 1,000 like this. Bring out the sword. Let's see whose baby this is. Look at what it says. And the king said, bring me a sword. And they brought the sword to king, the sword before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two. Now, I don't know if they were going to do from the head down to in between the legs or from the stomach going horizontally. You know, I don't know how they were planning on dividing the child. He didn't go into that. Divide the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. And then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child and in no wise slay. But the other one said, let it neither be mine nor thine, but divide it. You see that? When, when the, the manipulation demon realized that, 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 that she couldn't get what she wanted, all of a sudden, the spirit operates. And see, sometimes in life, it's not that easy. And that's why we have to make sure that we judge nothing before the time. For you to see that manipulation spirit, if she would have said that right from the get-go, you understand? But she didn't. It was later on that it was revealed. When God's judgment is operating through us, it glorifies Jesus. Amen. When God's judgment is operating through us, it glorifies Jesus. And 1 Kings 3.27 says, Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it, and she is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do the judgment. Do you see that this was a very unconventional judgment? Because I can see there are some people that are spiritually dead and spiritually blind, and they're, they're not really operating within the Holy Spirit. They're operating from a carnal mind, a natural mind, and they're looking from this perspective, and they're seeing that Solomon is taking a sword, and he's getting ready to tell them to cut the child in half. And some people, they would just stop right there. And the moment they saw something that they didn't agree with, they would say, oh, he ain't of God. They, they would have walked before. They would have judged the situation before the time, and they would have said, this man is a devil. And they would have walked out and said, that's why I ain't coming here no more. <laughs> I'm going to tell you any real person of God if they are and I'm not talking about seminary school if they're really operating at God they are going to do some things that trigger you or challenge you or question you but if you could just hold up on the judgment long enough, 
you'll see some things. Now, on that note, if you don't ever see nothing taking place, you have to, accordingly, amen, you have to judge accordingly too. You see, because sometimes with a weird judgment, and sometimes the weirder the judgment, the more people can see that God is actually operating through someone. Because God will do some things sometimes that are uncanny. But you have to make sure that you judge nothing before the time. People misjudge God's calling based off of their natural limitations. Now, I have this in here just to explain it a certain way. People misjudge God's calling based off of their natural limitations. I want to say people misjudge their calling. That's what I really wanted to say, but I, I can't word it that way. People misjudge their calling based off of their natural limitations, but I don't want to just say their calling because you could be called by the devil, you could be called by your boss, you could be called by all kinds of, so I have to say by God's calling. God has a calling for every us, every one of us. That's why the Bible says many are called. Many are called. And sometimes that calling that God is calling to you goes, it supersedes your natural limitations because God wants to take you to a place that you could not do on your own efforts so that when he takes you there, you recognize that it was not you who did it through your own efforts or through your own resources. God wants to take your two fish and five loaves and do something that you couldn't do, that Gordon Ramsay couldn't do. It's raw. You've given up. Or like emerald. Bam! You can bam all you want with those two fish and three loaves and three loaves and two fish. It ain't going to multiply and feed the thousands. But God wants to take you beyond your natural limitations. So what I'm saying here is that you have to judge nothing before the time. Even the calling that God has for you, you can't judge it based off of the present time. Because a lot of times in the present times, they can deceive you. And God is not limited or restricted by your present situation. In Genesis 18, 9, And they said unto him, Where is Sarah, thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to, look at this. To the time. And they said unto him, where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, behold in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the the time there are some things that God is going to do if you remain on the narrow road if you stay on course there are things that God will do in your life which is why you cannot judge before the time you can't judge based off of what you see what you smell, what you hear, it's going to require faith. All great callings of God require faith. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door and was behind him. And now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. And therefore Sarah laughed 
within herself. You see, there are some things that God is going to present to you that seem so outlandish that you laugh within yourself because it's absurd. God can take you to a place of absurdity where it's a ridiculous thing. There were people, there was a particular woman, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but I'm just going to present to you uh, the basics of the story. There was a woman that I've known that I was friends with for a long time. God gave her a dream of something that me and my wife was going to do. And at the time that she shared the dream with us, we both laughed about it because it was so ridiculous. It was so absurd. Why? Because of our natural restrictions, our natural limitations, our natural resources, our current situation was blinding us from even considering the dream that this woman was telling us that she saw me and my wife doing. And I'm talking about within a short, short time, it came to pass. And it came to pass, and we never told this woman that her dream came to pass. We eventually tell, told her, like, maybe, maybe even like seven years later, that the dream she had, it came to pass. You see, people misjudge God's calling, or people misjudge their calling based on their natural limitations. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am wax old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? That's what I want to ask you today. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Strongsville Christian Church, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Um, there was a MS he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance. To the Let no man deceive you. And recovering of sight by to the any blind, means, for the day shall not come, the except there come a falling away first. Strong's Christian Church.